between June 14, 1962 and January 4, 1964, a series of tragic events unfolded in the Boston area involving 13 single women who were victims of either a single serial killer or possibly multiple perpetrators. The public widely attributed at least 11 of these murders to the Boston Strangler. While law enforcement did not initially link all these crimes to a single culprit, public perception strongly associated them with one perpetrator. All the victims were found murdered in their apartments after being sexually assaulted and strangled with articles of clothing. The absence of signs of forced entry suggested that the assailant was known to the victims or was able to gain entry with their cooperation. These women were generally seen as respectable individuals leading quiet and modest lives. Although no one has ever stood trial as the Boston Strangler, public perception pointed towards Albert DeSalvo, who confessed to the 11 official Strangler murders along with two additional cases. Despite his detailed confessions, those who knew DeSalvo personally at the time found it difficult to believe he was capable of such heinous crimes. Presently, there is compelling evidence suggesting that DeSalvo may not have been the actual killer. This narrative presents both perspectives leaving the decision to the reader. It's a challenging choice, one that has stumped many psychiatrists, lawyers, criminologists, authors, and acquaintances of Albert DeSalvo. Among the 11 confirmed victims of the Boston Strangler, six were aged between 55 and 75. There were also two potential victims aged 85 and 69. The remaining five victims were notably younger, aged between 19 and 23. It's worth noting that while 55 years old might not be considered elderly by today's standards, nor was it considered so in 1962, especially not for individuals like Anna East Lessar, a petite divorcee who appeared much younger than her actual age. Over 10 years prior, Anna had left Latvia with her son and daughter, eventually settling into a modest apartment in a tranquil, traditional neighborhood within Boston's Back Bay area. Her residence at 77 Gainsborough Street was one of numerous brick townhouses partitioned into smaller units to accommodate individuals with restricted incomes, including students and retirees. Anna, a seamstress earning $60 weekly, resided on the third floor of the building. On the evening of June 14, 1962, Anna had finished dinner and hurriedly prepared for the Latvian memorial services at her church. With just enough time for a quick bath before her son, Eurus, was due to pick her up, she entered the bathroom in her robe and started the water, accompanied by the inspiring melodies of Tristan und Isolde. Shortly before seven, Eurus knocked on his mother's door, but there was no response, and the door was locked. He felt annoyed. He hadn't been keen on accompanying his mother to the services in the first place. Eurus pounded on the door, growing increasingly worried. Was his mother ill, lying helpless inside, or could something worse have happened? He remembered her sounding despondent on the phone the previous night. Desperate, he threw his weight against the door, causing it to burst open. His worst fears were realized when he discovered her lifeless body in the bathroom, the cord from her robe around her neck. Shocked and distraught, he immediately called the police and then contacted his sister in Maryland to deliver the tragic news of their mother's apparent suicide. In Gerald Frank's The Boston Strangler, homicide detectives James Mellon and John Driscoll were deeply affected by their first sight of Anna Leeser's body. Mellon vividly recalled the shocking scene. Anna lay naked and exposed in a grotesque position. She appeared fragile, with brown bobbed hair and a thin mouth, lying on her back on a gray runner. Her blue tida house coat with a red lining was spread apart completely in front, leaving her nude from the shoulders down. Her head was a few feet from the open bathroom door, her left leg stretched straight towards them, and the other leg flung wide at almost right angles, bent at the knees, causing her to be grossly exposed. Around her neck, the blue cloth cord of her house coat was tightly knotted with its ends turned up to resemble a bow tied in a childlike fashion under her chin. The sight was disturbing and haunting for Mellon and Driscoll, encapsulating the brutality and tragedy of the crime scene. The scene in the apartment was staged to appear as though a robbery had taken place. 
Anna's purse was found open, with items partially scattered on the floor. The kitchen waste basket had been rifled through, with trash spilled around it. Drawers in the bedroom dresser were left open and their contents disturbed. Interestingly, a case of color slides was deliberately placed on the bedroom floor, not dropped. Additionally, the record player was left on, but the amplifier was turned off. Despite these efforts to create the illusion of a burglary, certain valuables such as a gold watch and other jewelry were left undisturbed and untouched. This detail puzzled investigators, suggesting that the motive behind the crime might not have been straightforward theft, leading them to consider other possibilities and motives behind Anna Lassar's tragic death. Anna was found strangled with the cord from her robe, which had been tightly tied around her neck in a bow shape. Additionally, there were signs of sexual assault using an unidentified object. A thorough investigation into her background revealed a woman deeply committed to her church, children, work, and passion for classical music. She was a private person with very few friends, and there were no significant male relationships apart from her son. The police hypothesized that the incident initially appeared to be a burglary. It was theorized that upon encountering Anna in her robe, the intruder succumbed to an overwhelming urge to assault her, resulting in her death to prevent identification. A few weeks later, on June 30th, 68-year-old Na Nichols was discovered murdered in her apartment at 1940 Commonwealth Avenue in the Brighton area of Boston. The scene suggested a burglary, with every drawer pulled open and belongings strewn about as if a tornado had swept through. Surprisingly, certain valuable items like a set of sterling silver, cash in her purse, an expensive camera, and her watch were left undisturbed. The perpetrator had rifled through her address book and mail for unknown reasons. Ultimately, nothing was stolen. The disorder and ransacking appeared to serve no purpose. Na Nichols was found with her legs spread, her house coat and slip pulled up to her waist. Her neck was tightly bound with two of her own nylon stockings, tied with a bow. She had also been sexually assaulted, indicated by the presence of blood in her vagina. The estimated time of death was around five in the afternoon. Na, a retired psychotherapist, led a quiet and modest life. She had been widowed for two decades and had few male acquaintances apart from her brother-in-law. On that very same day, approximately 15 miles north of Boston in the suburb of Lynn, Helen Blake met a similar tragic fate. Sometime between 8 and 10 a.m., the 65-year-old divorcee was strangled with one of her own nylons. Her brassiere had been used to further secure the stocking around her neck, tied in a bow. Both her vagina and anus had been injured, although no spermatozoa were found. She was discovered lying face down and unclothed on her bed, with her legs apart. Helen's apartment had been thoroughly ransacked. It seemed that her two diamond rings had been forcibly removed from her fingers. Additionally, attempts were made to open a metal strongbox and a footlocker, although these efforts were unsuccessful. Police Commissioner Edmund McNamara reacted with great concern, issuing a warning to women in the Boston area to secure their doors and exercise caution with strangers. He canceled all police vacations and reassigned all detectives to focus on homicide investigations. A comprehensive inquiry commenced into known sex offenders and individuals with histories of violent behavior or mental illness. Authorities suspected the perpetrator might be targeting older women due to unresolved issues, potentially stemming from maternal resentment. A former FBI agent, Mania, urged the Bureau to conduct a seminar on sex crimes for his top 50 detectives. On August 19th, Ida Urga, a 75-year-old widow known for her shyness, tragically became a victim of the Strangler. Her body was discovered two days later in her apartment at 7 Even Grove Avenue in Boston's West End. Similar to the other incidents, there was no evidence of forced entry suggesting that the perpetrator may have been admitted willingly by Ida. Upon entering the apartment, Police Sergeant James McDonald described finding Ida lying on her back in the living room. She was wearing a torn light brown nightdress that exposed her body, with a white pillowcase tightly knotted around her neck. Her legs were spread apart, 
positioned approximately four to five feet apart from heel to heel, with her feet propped up on separate chairs and a standard bed pillow. This arrangement, facing the apartment's entrance, was a disturbing scene resembling an obstetrical position and would have been the first sight encountered upon entering the apartment. Many of these specific details were not disclosed to the press. The cause of death was determined to be manual strangulation, and dried blood was observed around her head, mouth, and ears. Additionally, evidence indicated that she had been sexually assaulted, although no sperm was found at the scene. Less than 24 hours after Ida Erga's murder, another tragic incident occurred involving 67-year-old nurse Jane Sullivan, who resided at 435 Columbia Road in Dorchester, across town from Ida's home. Jane had been deceased for approximately 10 days before her body was discovered. Police found her positioned in a disturbing manner in her bathtub, on her knees, with her feet elevated over the back of the tub and her head positioned beneath the faucet. Similar to other victims, Jane had been strangled using her own nylons, likely in areas of her apartment where bloodstains were detected on the floors, such as the kitchen, bedroom, or hallway. The state of decomposition of her body prevented a definitive determination of potential sexual assault, although bloodstains were discovered on the handle of a broom. Despite her purse being found open, there were no signs of forced entry or apparent ransacking of the apartment. This tragic event added to the growing concern and urgency within the community and law enforcement regarding these disturbing crimes. Following a three-month period of relative calm, Panic once again gripped all of Boston when tragedy struck on December 5, 1962. Sophie Clark, a beloved and attractive 21-year-old African-American student at the Carnegie Institute of Medical Technology, was discovered by her roommates in their apartment at 315 Huntington Avenue in the Back Bay area, just a few blocks from Anna Sars's residence. Sophie was found nude in the living room, with her legs spread wide apart. She had been strangled using three of her own nylon stockings, tightly knotted around her neck, along with her half-slip. Tragically, evidence of sexual assault was also present, with semen discovered near her body on the rug. Despite Sophie's cautious nature and the presence of a second lock on their apartment door, there was no sign of forced entry, indicating that the killer likely gained Sophie's trust to gain access. Sophie, who was known for her careful approach to security, even questioned visitors before allowing them inside. It was evident that she had fought back against her assailant. The killer had rifled through drawers and inspected her collection of classical records. Sophie had been in the midst of writing a letter to her boyfriend before being interrupted, presumably by the strangler. Notably, Sophie did not date anyone in the Boston area and maintained a reserved demeanor around men. This heartbreaking incident reignited fears and intensified efforts to apprehend the perpetrator responsible for these heinous acts of violence. The new details surrounding Sophie Clark's murder presented significant differences from previous strangler cases. Sophie was a young African-American woman who lived with roommates, and notably, semen was found at the crime scene for the first time. During police inquiries, Mrs. Marcella Lula, a neighbor in the same building, recounted an unsettling encounter that occurred around 2.20 that afternoon. A man knocked on her door, claiming to be sent by the superintendent to inspect her apartment for painting and repairs. He proceeded to make inappropriate comments about her appearance, suggesting she consider modeling. Mrs. Lula indicated she was married, which seemed to provoke the man's anger, causing him to abruptly leave, claiming he had the wrong apartment. Mrs. Lula provided a detailed description of the man, aged between 25 and 30, of average height with honey-colored hair, dressed in a dark jacket and dark green trousers. This encounter, coupled with the timing just before Sophie Clark's murder at around 2.30 in the afternoon, raised suspicions that this individual could indeed be the strangler. The fact that the building superintendent had not dispatched anyone for maintenance added to the suspicion surrounding the man's true intentions. These details intensified the urgency of the investigation, focusing attention on identifying and apprehending the perpetrator responsible for Sophie's tragic death. 
Three weeks later, on Monday, December 31, 1962, 23-year-old Patricia Bete, employed as a secretary at a Boston engineering firm, was discovered under troubling circumstances. Concerned by her absence from work, her boss visited her apartment at 515 Park Drive in the Back Bay area where she resided. Finding the apartment locked, her boss, assisted by the custodian, entered through a window. Inside, Patricia was found lying in bed, covered up to her chin as if taking a nap. Tragically, she had been strangled with several stockings and a blouse tightly knotted around her neck. Disturbingly, evidence suggested recent sexual activity and she was found to be in the early stages of pregnancy. Additionally, signs of injury to her rectum indicated further violence, and it was evident that the perpetrator had ransacked her home. For a few months, there was a lull in activity. During this period, the police seized the opportunity to retrace their steps and search for any connections among these individuals, whether they shared acquaintances, frequented similar locations, or shopped at the same places. They revisited potential suspects such as creeps, individuals with mental health issues, and those with deviant behavior, but these efforts yielded no substantial breakthroughs. In early March of 1963, a tragic incident occurred 25 miles north of Boston in Lawrence, where 68-year-old Mary Brown was discovered beaten to death in her apartment. Additionally, she had been strangled and sexually assaulted. Subsequently, the focus of the murder investigation shifted back to Boston. Two months later, on Wednesday, May 8, 1963, Beverly Sammons, a 23-year-old graduate student, failed to attend choir practice at the Second Unitarian Church in Back Bay. Concerned, her friend used a spare key to enter her apartment. Upon opening the door, he found Beverly lying on a sofa bed with her legs spread apart. Her hands were tied behind her using one of her scarves and a nylon stocking along with two handkerchiefs were knotted around her neck, covering her mouth. Beneath this ligature, a cloth had been placed and a second cloth was stuffed into her mouth. Despite the appearance of strangulation, Beverly had actually succumbed to four stab wounds to her throat. In total, she had endured 22 stab wounds, with 18 of them forming a bullseye pattern on her left breast. Notably, the ligature around her neck seemed more ornamental and was not tight enough to cause asphyxiation. The murder weapon, a bloody knife, was discovered in her kitchen sink. There was no evidence of sexual assault as no spermatozoa were found in her body. The investigation determined that Beverly had likely been deceased for about 48 to 72 hours before being discovered, suggesting her death occurred between late Sunday evening and Monday morning. She was pursuing studies to become an opera singer and had aspirations to audition for the Metropolitan Opera in New York later that year. Police speculated that due to her training as a singer, Beverly may have developed strong throat muscles, making it challenging for the perpetrator to strangle her. This difficulty potentially led to the use of stabbing as a means of causing fatal harm. The police, feeling increasingly desperate, were introduced to a copywriter named Paul Gordon, who claimed to possess special ESP abilities and professed to know the identity and appearance of the strangler. Despite the unconventional nature of this claim, the authorities were unusually open-minded. Paul began to describe the man responsible for Anna Lassar's death. I envision him as fairly tall, with bony hands, pale white skin, and red, bony knuckles. His eyes are deeply set and hollow. I was particularly struck by his eyes. His hair slightly disturbed me because he has a habit of pushing back a small curl that falls on his forehead. There's a missing tooth in the upper right front of his mouth. He resides in a hospital or some form of care facility. He's not confined. I know this because I see him strolling across a wide, expansive lawn. He is mobile and often sits on a bench within the grounds. He carries many burdens. He used to subject his mother to cruel beatings. She was a dominating figure and his two sisters led unhappy lives. The family hails from Mayer, Vermont. He is profoundly isolated. When in the city, I visualize him sleeping in a cellar, yet he enjoys roaming the streets, observing women, yearning to be as close to them as possible. You see, 
The unfortunate soul is in an eternal quest for his deceased mother, unable to locate her. During the investigation, a detective presented Paul Gordon with several photographs of men who had been apprehended for muggings or break-ins in the Back Bay area. Gordon identified one of the individuals, Arnold Wallace, as the strangler who matched Gordon's earlier description. Wallace, age 26, was a psychiatric patient at Boston State Hospital with grounds privileges. He had recently gone missing and was found sleeping in the basements of apartment buildings. Wallace had a history of violence, including instances of assaulting his mother. Subsequently, Gordon shifted his focus to the murder of Sophie Clark, accurately detailing her apartment as if he had visited it himself. According to Gordon, the perpetrator was a large, robust African-American man known to Sophie. Detectives were astounded by Gordon's precise description of the apartment. Additionally, a suspect named Louis Barnett, fitting Gordon's description, was under suspicion for Sophie's murder. Barnett had once dated Sophie, and it was plausible that she had allowed him entry into her apartment. Gordon confidently predicted that the strangler would soon reveal himself and confess. He assured the detectives that once this confession occurred, all the pieces of the puzzle would fall into place effortlessly, leaving the investigators feeling regretful for not having seen the truth sooner. When the police went to check on Arnold Wallace, they found out that he'd escaped the hospital five or six times, which happened to coincide with a strangling. Des Gordon also went to the hospital so that he could see Arnold Wallace in the flesh. He's the man, Gordon told them positively. The police decided to look into Gordon's activities before they went any further with Arnold Wallace. Gordon had been to the hospital before he talked to the police, so he could have seen Arnold on the grounds. Maybe the whole thing was a hoax. Maybe Gordon was the strangler. Arnold, whose IQ was between 60 and 70, was given a lie detector test. His low intelligence and his inability to distinguish between fantasy and reality made communication difficult. The test was inconclusive. He was taken back to the hospital while police tried to check out all of the circumstantial evidence. Following a quiet period throughout the summer of 1963, marked by no reported strangulations in June, July, and August, Another tragic incident occurred on September 8, 1963, in Salem. The victim, Evelyn Corbin, a 58-year-old divorcee who presented herself as younger than her actual age, was discovered murdered. She had been strangled with two of her nylon stockings, found lying face up and nudie across her bed. Additionally, her underpants had been used to gag her, and around the bed were tissues marked with lipstick, containing traces of semen. Notably, semen was found in her mouth, but not in her vagina. Although her apartment was locked, it had been thoroughly searched, yet nothing appeared to be stolen. A tray of jewelry was placed on the floor and her purse had been emptied onto the sofa. A perplexing detail emerged. Outside her window on the fire escape was a fresh donut, a clue that remained unexplained as it wasn't placed there by anyone from the building. On November 25, 1963, amidst the mourning for President John F. Kennedy's recent assassination, tragedy struck the Boston area once more. Joanne Graff, a 23-year-old industrial designer known for her conservative and religious values, was raped and murdered in her ransacked apartment in Lawrence. Her death occurred shortly before the president's assassination. Her body was discovered with two nylon stockings tied in an elaborate bow around her neck. Evidence of violence included teeth marks on her breast and lacerations around her vagina, indicating a brutal assault. At 3.25 p.m. on that fateful day, a student residing above Joanne's apartment heard footsteps in the hallway. Concerned about suspicious activity, he listened at his door and then witnessed a man, approximately 27 years old with pomaded hair, dressed in dark green slacks and a dark shirt and jacket, knocking on Joanne's door. The man inquired about Joan Graff, mispronouncing Joanne's name. The student informed him that Joanne lived on the floor below. Subsequently, he heard the door below open and close, assuming Joanne had admitted the visitor into her apartment. 
Worried when Joanne did not answer a friend's phone call 10 minutes later, the student's concern grew, underscoring the tragic events that had unfolded in Joanne's Lawrence residence. The morning before Joanne's tragic death, a woman residing in the apartment down the hall had a disturbing encounter. She heard sounds outside her door and then observed a piece of paper being slid under her door, moving silently from side to side. Suddenly, the paper disappeared, followed by the sound of footsteps. This unsettling incident left the woman feeling mesmerized and alarmed, foreshadowing the events that would later unfold with Joanne Graff's murder in the same vicinity. On January 4, 1964, a little over a month after Joanne Graff's death, two young women returned home from work to their apartment at 44A Charles Street to a horrifying discovery. Their new roommate, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, had been murdered in a grotesque and shocking manner. Similar to previous victims, Mary had been strangled using a dark stocking, with a pink silk scarf tied in a large bow under her chin, followed by another pink and white flowered scarf placed over the stocking. Additionally, a bright Happy New Year's card had been deliberately positioned against her feet, adding a chilling element to the disturbing crime scene. The situation deteriorated. She sat on the bed, leaning against the headboard, while thick liquid dripped from her mouth onto her bare chest. Additionally, a broomstick handle had been forcefully inserted three and one two inches into her vagina. This was the last straw. While people often criticize the police for various reasons, the truth remained that identifying serial killers, particularly intelligent ones who leave no traces, was exceedingly challenging. Despite the widespread panic among women in Boston and its suburbs, they continued to allow the killer or killers entry into their apartments. The police could only speculate whether these women allowed him into their homes due to familiarity or if he deceived them into admitting a stranger. A few weeks following Mary Sullivan's murder, Massachusetts Attorney General Edward Brooke assumed control. On January 17, 1964, the state's top law enforcement official made it clear that the case was his top priority. Brooke was not just an ordinary law enforcement figure or politician. He was exceptionally handsome, intelligent, and refined. Notably, he was the sole African-American attorney general in the nation. Moreover, he was a Republican in a predominantly Democratic state, posing significant political risks, especially if the strangler was never apprehended. However, Brooks' strategy was highly practical. He sought to assemble a team to oversee the investigation, spanning five police jurisdictions. This group would coordinate the efforts of various police departments, with dedicated staff solely focused on the Strangler case and no information withheld due to interdepartmental rivalries. This approach aimed to enhance collaboration and efficiency in a unique and challenging investigation. In addition, Brooks' task force aimed to counteract the influence of the newspapers. Two female reporters, Jean Cole and Loretta McLaughlin of The Record American, had focused on exposing the Boston Police Department's shortcomings, accusing them of severe inefficiencies. To lead this initiative, formerly known as the Special Division of Crime Research and Detection, Brooke appointed his close friend, Assistant Attorney General John S. Bottomley. Bottomley's selection was controversial due to his limited experience in criminal law. Nonetheless, his supporters emphasized his exceptional honesty and boundless enthusiasm. Given the unconventional nature of the case, Bottomley was seen as a proponent of non-traditional methods. Not everyone was supportive of Bottomley's qualifications. Edmund McNamara, the Boston Police Commissioner, reportedly exclaimed, Holy Jesus, what a nutcake! Novelist George Five Higgins, then working for the Associated Press, noted that Bottomley was frequently associated with the word attack, either as a prefix or suffix. Bottomley's core team included Detective Philip Den Natale and Special Officer James Mellon from the Boston Police Department, Metropolitan Police Officer Stephen Delaney, and State Police Detective Lieutenant Andrew Tooney. Dr. Donald Knifik led the Medical Psychiatric Advisory Committee, comprising several renowned experts in forensic medicine. Two months later, Governor P.E. offered a $10,000 reward 
for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individual responsible for the murders of the 11 confirmed victims of the Strangler. Before the Strangler Bureau could fully operationalize, it had several significant tasks to address. Firstly, it needed to gather, arrange, and integrate more than 37,000 pages of documentation from the multiple police departments involved in the case. Additionally, the medical committee was tasked with creating a profile of the perpetrator based on the characteristics of individuals likely to commit such murders. Forensic medical experts noted significant differences between the murders of older women and younger women, leading them to believe that it was unlikely one person was responsible for all the killings, suggesting the presence of copycats. They pondered what kind of person would be capable of such murders. Dr. Knifik's team outlined characteristics that law enforcement should focus on. The suspect would likely be at least 30 years old, possibly older, neat, orderly, and punctual, possibly working with his hands or having a handiwork-related hobby. They predicted he was likely single, separated, or divorced, not appearing outwardly deranged and lacking close friendships. Despite initial reluctance, Brooke eventually agreed to involve Peter Heros, a well-known Dutch psychic, following Liu's suggestion. Heros's services and expenses were covered by private groups, but he proved challenging to work with and later faced legal trouble for allegedly impersonating an FBI agent. Heros identified a suspect, previously investigated by the Strangler Bureau, who was a shoe salesman with a history of mental illness. However, there was no evidence linking the salesman to the murders, and he eventually committed himself to an institution. This episode damaged the Strangler Bureau's credibility significantly. Several years prior to the strangling murders, a peculiar series of sex offenses unfolded in the Cambridge area. A man in his late twenties would knock on apartment doors, introducing himself to young women with a deceptive pitch. Claiming to work for a modeling agency, he would assert that their names were recommended for potential modeling opportunities, promising modest attire and a generous pay of $40 per hour. Under the guise of taking measurements and gathering information, he would use this ruse to gain access to their homes. This man appeared affable and charming, sporting a boyish smile that put the women at ease. After completing his measurements, he would mention that Mrs. Lewis from the agency would follow up if their measurements were suitable. However, these promises were never fulfilled because neither Mrs. Lewis nor the modeling agency existed. Eventually, some of the women became suspicious and reported the incidents to the police. On March 17, 1961, a man was apprehended by Cambridge police while attempting to break into a residence. Not only did he admit to the break-in, but he also confessed to being known as the Measuring Man. This individual was identified as Albert DeSalvo, a 29-year-old with a history of arrests related to apartment burglaries and theft of money. DeSalvo resided in Malden with his German wife and two young children, and he worked as a press operator in a rubber factory during the day. When questioned about his actions, he explained, I'm not attractive, I'm not well educated, but I managed to deceive wealthy individuals. They were all college students, and I had never had anything in my life, yet I was able to outwit them. The judge, showing sympathy for DeSalvo's role as a provider for his family, reduced his sentence to 18 months with the possibility of early release for good behavior. DeSalvo was freed in April of 1962, two months prior to the discovery of the first victim of the strangler, Anna Lessar. Albert DeSalvo was born in Chelsea, Massachusetts on September 3, 1931. His parents, Frank and Charlotte, had five other children. Frank was a violently abusive man who regularly subjected his wife and children to physical violence. During his youth, DeSalvo often found himself in trouble, being arrested multiple times for assault and battery. Despite periods of good behavior, he would sometimes lapse into petty criminal activities. Charlotte, his mother, remarried and made significant efforts to guide her son away from trouble. Despite occasional disappointments due to his behavior, their relationship remained relatively positive. From 1948 to 1956, DeSalvo served in the Army, 
and was stationed in Germany, where he met his wife, Mard Beck, from a respectable family. He achieved the rank of Specialist E5 at one point, but was later demoted to private for failing to follow orders. He received an honorable discharge in 1955. Although arrested for fondling a young girl, the charge against him was eventually dropped. During this time, his first child was born, Judy, who suffered from a congenital pelvic disease that greatly affected their family life. Concerned about the risk of having another child with a physical handicap and did everything she could do to avoid sex. DeSalvo, on the other hand, had an abnormally voracious sexual appetite, requiring sex many times. Between 1956 and 1960, Albert DeSalvo had multiple arrests for breaking and entering, each resulting in a suspended sentence. In 1960, his son Michael was born without any physical handicaps. Despite his legal troubles, Albert managed to maintain employment. He worked as a press operator at American Biltright Rubber, then at a shipyard, and later as a construction maintenance worker. Despite his criminal activities, Albert was generally well-liked by those who knew him. His employer described him as a good, decent family man and a dedicated worker. Albert was devoted to his family and treated his wife with affection. However, aside from his criminal behavior, he had a serious flaw. He was a chronic braggart who always sought to outdo others in any situation. Police Commissioner Edward Mamera summed up Albert's personality by calling him a blowhard. In early November of 1964, nearly three years after his last release from jail, Albert DeSalvo faced more serious charges than his previous arrests for breaking and entering and measuring prospective models. On October 27th, a newly married woman was resting in bed shortly after her husband had left for work when a man entered her room and held a knife to her throat. He threatened to kill her if she made a sound, gagged her with underwear, and tied her in a spread eagle position to the bedpost using her own clothes. He then kissed and fondled her before asking for directions to exit the apartment, instructing her to remain silent for ten minutes. Eventually, he apologized and fled the scene. The victim had a clear view of his face, and a police sketch resembled the suspect known as the Measuring Man. DeSalvo was brought to the station, where the victim positively identified him through a one-way mirror. DeSalvo was released on bail as usual. His photo circulated through police networks, leading to his arrest in Connecticut, where he was sought for similar assaults attributed to the Green Man, named for his green work pants. DeSalvo was arrested at home, causing embarrassment when his wife witnessed him in handcuffs, though she was not surprised given his sexual obsessions. Acknowledging his compulsions, DeSalvo confessed to a string of crimes, admitting to breaking into 400 apartments and committing a couple of rapes. He claimed to have assaulted approximately 300 women across four states, though his tendency to exaggerate made the actual number uncertain. Many incidents went unreported, and victims were reluctant to detail the assaults. DeSalvo was sent to Bridgewater Hospital for evaluation, with police requesting a psychiatric examination, despite doubts that he was the infamous Strangler. During his time at Bridgewater, DeSalvo encountered George Nassar, a highly intelligent and manipulative inmate charged with a brutal murder. Nassar, with an almost genius-level IQ and impressive linguistic skills, became DeSalvo's confidant upon their incarceration in the same wing. In early March of 1965, Armguard DeSalvo received a call at her sister's house in Denver from F. Lee Bailey, claiming to be Albert's attorney. He urgently advised her to assume a different identity, take her children, and go into hiding immediately to escape the imminent media storm about Albert's actions that would soon hit the headlines. Bailey warned that a major revelation concerning Albert would be splashed across every newspaper within 24 hours. He assured her of his arrival the next day to provide assistance. The following day, Armguard learned that Albert had confessed to being the notorious Strangler. Shocked and disbelieving, she disconnected the call in utter disbelief. She struggled to comprehend why Albert would fabricate such a horrific confession. Armguard refused to accept that he was capable of such brutality, believing instead that this was another of Albert's attempts to aggrandize himself. 
Albert de Salvo began to consider the possibility of financial gain as a motive for confessing to the crimes attributed to the strangler. Facing serious charges and the prospect of spending the rest of his life in prison, Albert became increasingly concerned about providing for his wife, arm guard, and their two children. In this desperate situation, the idea of selling his story and potentially collecting reward money started to form in his mind. Believing that newspapers might offer monetary incentives for exclusive stories or confessions, Albert saw an opportunity to secure financial support for his family. The prospect of leveraging his situation for financial gain became a strategy he considered while incarcerated, driven by his desire to ensure his family's well-being amid his legal predicament. Some months ago, prior to Albert being transferred to Bridgewater, his attorney John S. Guerin visited Albert, who inquired, What would be your response if someone presented you with the most significant story of the century? Albert responded, Do you mean the Boston Strangler? Confirming this, Albert asked, Yes. Are you involved in all of them, Albert? Did you commit some of them? All of them. Albert conceded that he believed the story could potentially generate money for his family. Uncertain about how to proceed with this information and seriously considering the possibility that Albert was mentally unstable, Guerin initiated a discreet investigation. Meanwhile, while Albert was at Bridgewater, he developed a friendship with George Nassar. Whether it was Nassar's or Albert's idea, the two discussed the reward money offered for information leading to the Boston Strangler's conviction. Nassar and DeSalvo mistakenly believed that $10,000 would be paid for each victim of the Strangler, amounting to a total of $110,000 for the 11 official victims. They contemplated a scenario where Nassar would turn DeSalvo in and DeSalvo would confess, allowing them to arrange a deal to split the reward money. DeSalvo, anticipating spending the rest of his life in an institution, did not plan to face execution. Moreover, no one had been executed in the state for 17 years, giving him a good chance of convincing psychiatrists that he was mentally unfit and could thus spend his life in a mental hospital rather than a prison. This outcome seemed preferable, especially since he wouldn't need to worry about providing for his family. F. Lee Bailey, renowned for his work on the Dr. Sam Shepard case, served as George Nassar's lawyer. Upon learning about Albert DeSalvo from Nassar, Bailey visited Albert on March 6th, equipped with a dictaphone. During this visit, Albert not only confessed to the murders of the 11 recognized victims, but also admitted to killing two additional women, Mary Brown in Lawrence and another elderly woman who passed away from a heart attack before he could strangle her. Bailey sought a way for Albert to confess without facing execution, yet his primary concern was confirming Albert's guilt without endangering his client. Bailey reached out to Lieutenant Donovan, proposing a potential suspect but requesting specific questions to help validate the suspect's claims. Armed with his recording device, Bailey returned to visit DeSalvo on March 6, 1965, for a second meeting. Albert mentioned that Detective Denali from the Attorney General Strangler Bureau had suddenly taken an interest in him and had come to collect his palm print the day before. Bailey realized he needed to act swiftly to protect his client. Reflecting on the interview, Bailey stated, I became convinced that the man sitting in that dimly lit room with me was the Boston Strangler. Experienced in interrogation, Bailey could discern between genuine recollections and fabricated stories. DeSalvo's mannerisms indicated authenticity. He wasn't struggling to remember words, but vividly recalling scenes he had lived through. He could effortlessly recall minor details, like rug colors, photograph content, or furniture conditions. Descriptions flowed calmly, akin to narrating a mundane errand rather than detailing serious crimes. DeSalvo recounted the details of his attack on 75-year-old Ida Urge in August 1962. He explained how he initially gained entry by suggesting he needed to work in her apartment, despite her initial distrust due to ongoing events. DeSalvo briefly engaged with her, then suggested returning the next day if she didn't trust him. 
As he started to leave, she invited him in, leading to the bedroom where he claimed to be inspecting a window leak. DeSalvo described approaching her from behind and manually strangling her. When questioned by Bailey about the layout of the apartment, DeSalvo mentioned passing through a parlor and dining room before reaching the bedroom, with the kitchen preceding it. He vividly recalled details like the white, unmade bed and empty dresser drawers. After strangling Ida Urge, he positioned her legs on chairs in the dining room. Bailey probed DeSalvo's motives for targeting an elderly woman. DeSalvo asserted that attractiveness wasn't a factor, simply being a woman was sufficient motivation for him. This chilling account painted a disturbing picture of DeSalvo's crimes and his detached demeanor while recounting them. DeSalvo then recounted the attack on Sophie Clark, a 22-year-old student killed in December 1962. He described her appearance, her reluctance to let him in because her roommates were out, and his deceitful offer of modeling and photography work to gain entry. DeSalvo vividly recalled specific details of Sophie's apartment, including the yellowish faded door and the interior furnishings like the flatbed with colorful pillows. Bailey, recognizing the wealth of verifiable details provided by DeSalvo, took decisive action. He played the recorded interview for Detectives Donovan and Sherry at different speeds to disguise DeSalvo's voice. The detectives paid close attention as DeSalvo described the assault on Sophie Clark. DeSalvo disclosed intimate details, such as discovering Sophie was menstruating during the assault and how he disposed of a chair and a pack of cigarettes during the attack. Lieutenant Sherry corroborated DeSalvo's account by presenting a photograph showing the bureau and the pack of cigarettes in the described locations, confirming the authenticity of DeSalvo's narrative. Commissioner McNamer and Dr. Ames Roby from Bridgewater were brought in for consultation. After further discussions with DeSalvo, Bailey persuaded him to cooperate with the police and undergo a lie detector test, marking a significant development in the investigation. This gripping account showcases the meticulous approach taken by Bailey and law enforcement to validate DeSalvo's confessions and gather crucial evidence in the case. They really couldn't go too far without getting John Bottomley, the head of Edward Brooks' Strangler Bureau, involved. Subsequently, there was a lot of unpleasant legal wrangling while Bailey tried to protect his client from execution and Attorney General Brooke wanted to keep control of the investigation. The stakes were now higher, so much so that Brooke was going to run for senator with the incumbent retiring. The resolution of the Strangler case would be a nice boost to his campaign. The extensive interrogation of Del Salvo regarding all the murders and the thorough investigation of every aspect of his confession were crucial. Ultimately, the interrogation concluded on September 29, 1965, yielding over 5,050 hours of recorded tapes and 2,000 pages of transcriptions. As each detail of the confession was verified, Bottomley, Brooke, and Bailey endeavored to establish guidelines for the next steps in the process. Initial skepticism regarding Del Salvo's claim to be the strangler was rapidly fading away. Del Salvo's detailed recollections of each murder reinforced this shift. He accurately recalled specific details such as the notebook under the bed of victim number eight, Beverly Salmons, and the Christmas bells on Patricia Bizet's door. Del Salvo even sketched precise floor plans of the victim's apartments. He mentioned taking a raincoat from Anna Sars's apartment to cover his blood-stained shirt and jacket, a detail later verified by detectives who discovered that Mrs. Sleers had purchased two identical coats, one of which was given to a relative. Detectives presented Del Salvo with 15 raincoats including the duplicate and others in various styles, and Del Salvo correctly identified the one he had taken. He recounted a failed attempt to attack a Danish girl in her Boston apartment. Del Salvo managed to gain entry and had his arm around her neck when he caught sight of himself in a large wall mirror, realizing he was on the brink of committing murder. Overwhelmed by horror, he released his grip and began to cry. Expressing fear, he pleaded with her not to involve the police, citing the potential consequences of his actions on his allowance from his mother and his college education. The young woman chose not to report the incident. With only Del Salvo's recollection to rely on, 
Natalie faced uncertainty. However, it comes as no surprise that she vividly recalled the incident. Ultimately, the Strangler Bureau reached the same conclusion as F. Lee Bailey. Albert Del Salvo was indeed the Boston Strangler. However, a more significant challenge emerged. How to balance the rights of the confessed Strangler with the public's demand for justice. Those familiar with Del Salvo, including his wife, family, former employers, lawyer, a prominent prison psychiatrist, and even the police who had encountered him through numerous arrests for breaking and entering, unanimously rejected the notion that he was the strangler. They viewed him as a kind and decent family man, albeit with a tendency towards petty theft. Susan Kelly in The Boston Stranglers, the public conviction of Albert DeSalvo and the true story of 11 shocking murders, presents a compelling case asserting Albert DeSalvo's innocence regarding the strangling murders. She enumerates several factors supporting this perspective, among which stands out the absence of any tangible evidence linking DeSalvo to the crimes and the inability of any eyewitness to position him at or in close proximity to any of the crime scenes. Albert possessed a notably distinctive facial feature, particularly his prominent beak-like nose. Various eyewitnesses reported encounters with the strangler or stranglers, as some experts speculate multiple perpetrators. Kenneth Rowe, an engineering student residing above Joan Graff's apartment, interacted with an individual seeking her apartment shortly before her demise. However, when presented with a photo of Albert Del Salvo, Rowe did not recognize him as the person seeking Joanne. Similarly, Jules Venn, proprietor of Martin's Tavern near Joan Graff's residence in Lawrence, failed to identify Del Salvo as the individual who, according to Rowe's description, entered the tavern appearing nervous and agitated, as if being followed. Furthermore, Eileen O'Neill was unable to identify Del Salvo as the person she observed near Mary Sullivan's bathroom window around the time of her death. Moreover, Kelly highlights that three freshly discarded Salem cigarette butts were discovered in an ashtray adjacent to Mary Sullivan's bed. Notably, neither Mary nor her housemates were known to smoke this brand. Similarly, a Salem cigarette butt was recovered from the toilet of apartment 4C at 315 Huntington Avenue in Boston on the day Sophie Clark passed away there. It's noteworthy that Albert Del Salvo was a non-smoker. What's even more striking are the reactions of two significant eyewitnesses upon encountering Albert and his associate, George Nassar, whom they believed to be the killer. Marcella Lula, a resident in the same apartment building as Sophie Clark, had a notable encounter with an individual identifying himself as Mr. Thompson, claiming to be a painter scheduled to work on her apartment. Describing Mr. Thompson as approximately 5'9", tall, with pale honey-colored hair slicked straight back over an oval-shaped face, Lula noted he could have been either a light-skinned black man or a white individual. She estimated his age to be around 25 years old. Lula managed to dismiss him by fabricating that her husband was asleep inside their apartment. This interaction occurred shortly before Sophie Clark's tragic murder. Subsequently, Mrs. Lula provided a sketch to the authorities, depicting Tom. The drawing portrayed a finely featured young man with the elongated face, a slender nose, a pointed chin, and large almond-shaped eyes. Remarkably, the sketch bore no resemblance to Albert Del Salvo. When Albert commenced confessing to the strangulations, Bottomley arranged for Mrs. Lula and Gertrude Gruen to secretly visit Albert in prison. Gertrude Gruen was particularly significant, as she was then regarded as the sole woman to have survived an encounter with the Strangler. She had put up a formidable fight against her attacker, prompting him to flee. Both women anticipated they were going to see one individual, Albert de Salvo. However, they were unaware that they would also encounter another man, George Nassar. The women assumed their roles as visitors in the prison's visiting room. Nassar was the initial person to enter the room, intending to meet with a prison social worker. Gerald Frank describes an unexpected reaction. George Nassar cast a sharp glance at Gertrude Gruan, 
not once, but twice. She sensed something unsettling, even alarming and strangely familiar about him. Could he possibly know her? In that moment, DeSalvo entered and seated himself across the table from Dr. Allen. Miss Gruen observed him closely. No, he wasn't the man who conversed with her, attempted to strangle her, the man she fiercely fought against, the man who hastily fled when her screams alerted workers to the roof, peering into her windows. However, the man currently engaged in conversation with the social worker, the man whose dark eyes had scrutinized her so intensely. Moments later, in Dr. Roby's office, surrounded by law enforcement, she spoke anxiously. I don't know what to say, I'm so upset. She seemed on the brink of emotional collapse. Eventually, she managed to articulate, it was not Albert de Salvo. Despite noticing certain resemblances when shown his photographs a week prior, she was now convinced otherwise. Now I'm certain he's not the man, she affirmed. However, the first individual to enter, George Nassar, I realized how shocked I was when I saw him, to witness this man, his eyes, his hair, his hands, his entire demeanor. He resembled the man who attacked me, walked, carried himself like him, his posture. My strong inclination is that he bore significant resemblances to the man who invaded my apartment. Yet she remained uncertain. Frustrated tears streamed down her face. She yearned desperately to identify this man. She also highlights several sources of information available to Albert that could have contributed to his knowledge about the crimes. Newspaper accounts provided extraordinarily detailed coverage, with the Record American even publishing a chart alongside the victim's photos titled The Facts on Reporter's Strangler Work Worksheet. This chart summarized crucial details of each crime including victim's attire, hobbies, affiliations, and more. Kelly suggests that DeSalvo had committed this chart to memory, evident in his confession to John Bottomley, where he not only accurately recalled the information, but also the few inaccuracies it contained. Additionally, leaks from law enforcement agencies, particularly the Strangler Bureau, criticized for its loose handling of accumulated material, and the Suffolk County Medical Examiner, accused of holding unauthorized press conferences where information about victim autopsies was freely disseminated, could have contributed to Albert's knowledge. Furthermore, Albert's own experiences as a burglar placed him in many of the apartment buildings where the murders occurred. He was familiar with the layouts of these apartments, and according to Kelly, had visited each one after the murders. Information deliberately and inadvertently supplied to Albert by individuals eager to conclude the investigation, such as John Bottomley, who, as per Kelly, knowingly and intentionally furnished Albert with details about the murders while taking his confession. This might clarify why the only publicly released version of the confession was abridged and extensively edited. The complete rendition largely absolves de Salvo. There's also the possibility of information being provided by another suspect who may have coached DeSalvo on the specifics. Law enforcement speculated that George Nassar could have served as one such source of information. In conclusion, experts never regarded the stranglings as the handiwork of a single individual. The modus operandi varied, and the victims exhibited significant differences as a collective. Kelly outlined some of the more apparent distinctions. For instance, there's no resemblance between the relatively delicate killing of Patricia Bissell, whose assailant tucked her into bed, and the gruesome homicidal assault inflicted upon Mary Sullivan, whose murderer not only sought to degrade her by inserting a broom handle into her vagina, but also aimed to mock the person discovering her body by placing a greeting card against her foot. Beverly Sammons was stabbed, but not subjected to sexual assault, while Joanne Graff was both raped vaginally and strangled. Evelyn Corbin likely performed oral sex on her assailant under duress. Jane Sullivan was left face down to decompose in a bathtub, whereas Ida Ergo was positioned in the living room with her legs splayed out and propped up on a chair. Serial killers typically exhibit a pattern in selecting and targeting their victims. For instance, Jack the Ripper targeted prostitutes, Ted Bundy preyed on attractive, long-haired young women, 
and Jeffrey Dahmer pursued young boys among others. However, the victims of the Strangler murders display a wide range in terms of age, attractiveness, and race, which contradicts typical serial killer profiling expertise. One plausible explanation is that some of the crimes were committed by a single individual, particularly the homicides of Ida Ergo, Jane Sullivan, and Helen Blake. As for Mary Mullen, the elderly woman who died of a heart attack, Kelly suggests that this might be the only killing DeSalvo is guilty of. It's possible that he burglarized her apartment and she succumbed to fright. This scenario aligns with the actions of Albert DeSalvo, who carried his unintended victim to her couch and fled without stealing anything. The murders of Ida Ergo and Jane Sullivan were particularly brutal. However, the case of Mary Brown raises intriguing questions. She was raped, strangled, and fatally beaten in Lawrence in early March of 1963. Albert's confession regarding this crime was notably vague, with numerous inaccuracies in the details provided. It's plausible that Albert had been informed about this crime by the Bridgewater inmate who was truly responsible. Kelly suggests a connection between Mary Brown and the man whom George Nassar fatally shot in 1948, as they both lived on the same street. Once the Commonwealth became convinced that DeSalvo was indeed the Boston Strangler, several complex legal issues had to be addressed before any trial could proceed. Essentially, DeSalvo's confession couldn't be admitted as evidence. Bailey articulated this to Brooke and Bottomley, stating, When I first met Albert, there were enough indictments pending against him to ensure he'd never walk free again. Now that we've helped uncover his involvement in multiple murders, it's certain he'll never see the outside again. Show me a way to avoid the death penalty. I'll accept the risk of conviction but not execution, and you can have anything else you want. I know neither of you truly wants him to face the death penalty. Tell me, is that asking too much? Brooke didn't believe Bailey's request was unreasonable, but he wanted time to consider it further. At this juncture, Brooke was a strong candidate for the Senate, and they agreed it would be unwise to hold DeSalvo's trial during the campaign. Nonetheless, Bailey managed to secure a ruling on DeSalvo's mental competence to stand trial. Despite objections from Dr. Roby, DeSalvo was deemed mentally fit to face trial. Finally, on January 10, 1967, Albert DeSalvo stood trial on the Greenman charges. Bailey outlined the basic strategy he aimed to employ to persuade the jury to find Albert not guilty by reason of insanity. It was straightforward. He intended to utilize the 13 murders attributed to the Boston Strangler to demonstrate the extent of Albert's insanity. To accomplish this, he sought to introduce both Albert's confession and the police's corroboration into evidence. Admittedly, the situation was highly unusual. Bailey sought the right to defend a man against robbery and assaults by proving his involvement in 13 murders. Donald Elon headed the prosecution team while Ethel Bailey led the defense in Judge Cornelius Monahan's courtroom. Four Greenman victims were called to testify, each recounting strikingly similar experiences. DeSalvo would either manipulate the door or gain entry through verbal persuasion. Once inside, he would bind the woman, undress her, fondle her breasts, and demand oral sex, stopping short of rape. He would employ a knife or toy gun to ensure compliance. Upon completing his actions, he would take money and jewelry from the victims. Bailey made the strategic decision not to cross-examine the witnesses, believing there was nothing to gain by doing so. In his opening statement, Bailey asserted that he harbored no doubts regarding DeSalvo's commission of the charged crimes, emphasizing that the only issue at hand was whether the Commonwealth could prove he was not insane at the time. Bailey presented expert witnesses to testify to Albert's paranoid schizophrenia. They contended that while Albert was aware his actions were wrong, his Green Man crime stemmed from an irresistible impulse. However, K.H. noted that the non-sexual aspects of the crimes, such as jimmying locks, deceptive entry, and theft of valuables, did not align with the concept of irresistible impulse. The psychiatrist concurred stating that only the sexual assaults were indicative of such impulses. After deliberating for four hours, the jury found DeSalvo guilty on all counts, 
and sentenced him to life in prison. DeSalvo's request for psychiatric assistance was denied, leaving Bailey deeply frustrated. My aim was to have the Strangler placed in a hospital where medical professionals could attempt to understand the motivations behind his crimes, Bailey expressed his disappointment. Society has been deprived of an opportunity for a study that could potentially aid in preventing other mass killers from acting out as they lurk among us, awaiting the trigger that sets them off. Albert DeSalvo was serving his life sentence at Walpole State Prison, known as MCI Cedar Junction, when he was fatally stabbed in the infirmary in November of 1973. The night prior to his murder, he urgently called Dr. Ames Roby, expressing great fear. Roby assured DeSalvo they would meet the following morning, but unfortunately, DeSalvo was killed that very night. Additionally, he had requested another individual, a reporter, to join him and Roby for the meeting. Roby elaborated, stating, He intended to reveal the true identity of the Boston Strangler and shed light on the entire situation. About a week before, he requested to be placed in the infirmary under special lockup. It seemed he was sensing urgency within the prison environment, prompting him to speak out quickly. There were individuals within the prison, including guards, who held animosity towards him. Someone must have left numerous doors open, which required collusion among several guards, as one would have to pass by. It suggests that a significant number of people were either paid or coerced to turn a blind eye to something. Nevertheless, someone plunged a knife into Albert DeSalvo's heart sometime between the evening check and the morning. Officials suspected that Albert's death was connected to his participation in a prison drug operation. Three men were brought to trial, but both attempts ended in hung juries. Here is the poem Albert wrote a few years before his death. Here is the story of the strangler yet untold, the man who claims he murdered 13 women young and old. The elusive strangler, there he goes, where his wanderings send him, no one knows. He struck within the light of day, leaving not one clue astray. Young and old, their lips are sealed, their secret of death never revealed. Even though he's sick in mind, he's much too clever. For the police to find, to reveal his secret, will bring him fame, but burden his family with unwanted shame. Today he sits in a prison cell deep inside, only a secret he can tell. People everywhere are still in doubt, is the strangler in prison or roaming about? Although Albert DeSalvo was never formally charged with the strangulation murders of 11 women due to a lack of evidence, many believed he was the Boston Strangler, especially after his confession. However, two individuals intimately connected to the case hold the belief that he didn't commit the crimes. One of them is Albert's brother, Richard DeSalvo, and the other is Casey Sherman, the nephew of the Strangler's last known victim, Mary Sullivan, both men and their families are steadfast in their conviction that Albert DeSalvo was not responsible for Mary Sullivan's murder. If their assertions hold true, it could potentially overturn the prosecution's case against DeSalvo and raise significant doubts about the entire Boston Strangler case, which involved the sexual assault and murder of 11 Boston area women between 1962 and 1964. Ironically, it was Albert DeSalvo's own taped confession that convinced the families he was not the killer. Despite police assertions that he must have been the killer because he knew details only the perpetrator would know, upon listening to the confession tape, discrepancies became apparent. He confesses to events that simply never happened, stated Casey Sherman. Mary Sullivan, who was murdered in 1964 at age 19, was Casey's aunt. Albert DeSalvo, a blue-collar worker with a wife and children, confessed to all the Boston Strangler murders as well as two others, yet there was no physical evidence linking him to the crime scenes. He did not match witness descriptions of potential suspects. His name was absent from a list of over 300 suspects compiled by investigators, and he was never brought to trial for any of the killings. DeSalvo was sentenced to life in prison for a series of rapes and sexual assaults and was stabbed to death in the maximum security state prison at Walpole in 1973. Before his death, he recanted his confession. 
At the time of his demise, he feared for his life and had been placed in the prison infirmary for added protection. In October 2000, the two families came together to have Mary Sullivan's remains exhumed for DNA testing, a technology that was not available nearly 37 years prior. They anticipated the results, expected in early 2001, would increase pressure on prosecutors to release old evidence they believed would exonerate DeSalvo. Casey Sherman and his family also maintained their belief that Mary's killer remained unidentified. For the DeSalvo family, the primary objective was to clear their family name. Richard J. Salvo revealed that his family had endured constant harassment and stigma due to the Boston Strangler case, leading to rifts within the family. All 11 women presumed to be the Strangler's victims were strangled with items of their own clothing, with one victim also being stabbed multiple times. The prosecution consistently argued that Albert DeSalvo possessed information only the killer would know. Sherman countered this by suggesting DeSalvo could have obtained details about Mary Sullivan's murder from newspapers. This perspective finds support in Susan Kelly's 1995 book, Boston Stranglers, The Wrongful Conviction of Albert DeSalvo and the True Story of Eleven Shocking Murders, where she goes further, proposing that DeSalvo might have learned the specifics from the actual killer during his time in prison. In his confession, Albert DeSalvo claimed to have strangled Mary Sullivan with his hands, while in reality, she was strangled with her own clothing. DeSalvo also asserted that he raped her, whereas evidence indicated she was sexually assaulted with a broomstick. A forensic scientist involved in an autopsy arranged by the families noted that experts were unable to find evidence of a blow DeSalvo alleged to have inflicted on Sullivan. Additionally, DeSalvo claimed to have left a knife in a sweater at the murder scene, but neither the knife nor the sweater were discovered. Tests were conducted on 68 samples of hair, semen, and tissue taken from Sullivan's exhumed body. Richard DeSalvo stated that his brother's body would also be exhumed if it would aid their case. Casey Sherman suggested that a prime suspect in his aunt's murder was a former boyfriend of one of her roommates, as there was no evidence of forced entry into her apartment. Richard DeSalvo believes his brother confessed to the Boston Strangler killings because he knew he was facing a life sentence for other crimes and wanted to capitalize on book and movie deals to support his family. According to the families, Albert's lawyer, F. Lee Bailey, persuaded him that if he confessed, he would be sent to a mental institution rather than prison. Although Bailey maintains that Albert DeSalvo is the Boston Strangler, he supports the family's efforts to conduct DNA tests, believing the results will confirm DeSalvo's guilt. The state attorney general's office conducted an assessment of the Sullivan homicide, but has consistently denied the family's access to evidence, citing the unresolved nature of the case. In October 2000, a judge instructed both parties to attempt to find a resolution, yet cooperation from Boston authorities was lacking. Jerry Leone, head of the Criminal Bureau at the Massachusetts Attorney General's office, emphasized that if evidence points to a different suspect in Sullivan's murder, it does not automatically cast doubt on the other Boston Strangler cases, nor does it guarantee reinvestigation of those cases. Our focus on the Sullivan case stems from its potential for via vu prosecution based on available evidence, Leone remarked. Conversely, Richard Del Salvo asserts that if his brother is proven innocent of Mary Sullivan's murder, it raises significant questions about the perpetrator of the other crimes. Attorney General Thomas Riley adamantly opposed the release of any evidence, prompting the families to revive their lawsuit against the state of Massachusetts. On February 23, 2001, Judge William G. Young reinstated the lawsuit demanding the disclosure of all evidence related to the OR investigation, enabling the families to conduct their independent inquiries. Subsequently, the state filed a motion seeking dismissal. Following a private investigation led by Casey Sherman, both families became even more convinced that Delvo was coerced into confessing under the impression that it would garner him favorable treatment. To bolster their argument, the family presented the findings of forensic tests conducted on Mary Sullivan's remains, revealing no signs of head trauma or damage to the delicate neck bones typically associated with strangulation. 
The decision now lay in the hands of Judge Young. If the lawsuit succeeded, authorities would be compelled to provide the families with all Boston Strangler investigation evidence for private analysis. Conversely, if the lawsuit failed, the family was prepared to pursue an appeal. Most significantly, if DNA results definitively established that Del Salvo was not the perpetrator, the entire case might be reopened, initiating a new quest to apprehend the true Boston Strangler. On October 20, 2001, new DNA examinations were scheduled to be conducted on evidence obtained from the remains of Mary Sullivan, one of the 11 victims attributed to Albert Del Salvo, the alleged Boston Strangler. Massachusetts Attorney General Thomas Riley ordered these tests. Concerns regarding the investigation's handling have been legitimately raised by the family. They have requested our scrutiny, and we are actively investigating. The Sullivan family has long contended that Mary was not a victim of the Boston Strangler and maintains that her true assailant remains at large. This recent development stemmed directly from independent inquiries launched by relatives of both Sullivan and DeSalvo, exerting additional pressure on authorities to reassess their conclusions. A week later, on Friday, October 26, 2001, a report from the Associated Press detailed the exhumation of Albert D. Salvo's body from a burial site in Massachusetts. The remains were transported to a forensic laboratory at York College, Pennsylvania, for examination. The following Saturday, an autopsy was conducted with the aim of potentially proving Del Salvo's innocence of the murders and perhaps identifying the true perpetrator. James Z. Stars, a professor of forensic sciences at George Washington University, led the team of scientists conducting the autopsy. Stars is renowned for his work in identifying individuals in other notable cases, such as the Lizzie Borden Hatchet murders, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, and the outlaw Jesse James. Speaking to the AP, Starr stated, The family has harbored dissatisfaction for many years regarding the death of Albert de Salvo and the failure to convict anyone for it. On Thursday, December 13, 2001, DNA evidence extracted from Mary Sullivan's remains failed to match Albert del Salvo. During a press briefing, James Starrs informed journalists, We discovered evidence that unequivocally excludes Albert de Salvo. Stars emphasized that the evidence absolved Del Salvo solely of the charge of sexual assault. While he refrained from divulging specifics of the analysis, he remarked to reporters, If I were a juror, I would vote for acquittal without hesitation. Casey Sherman, Mary Sullivan's nephew, who has long harbored doubts regarding Del Salvo's culpability in his aunt's death and the other attributed murders, expressed vindication at Starr's findings. If Del Salvo did not murder Mary Sullivan, despite his detailed confession, then he could not have committed any of these crimes, Sherman asserted. He also revealed to reporters that prior to Del Salvo's confession, the police had identified a different suspect in Sullivan's murder, but abandoned the investigation once Del Salvo confessed. Sherman urged law enforcement to pursue the real perpetrator, whom he believed to still be alive and residing in New England. Americans are drawn to larger-than-life narratives, and one firmly entrenched in the American consciousness is the notion that Albert Del Salvo was the infamous Boston Strangler. However, few realize that he was never formally tried for these crimes, and even fewer are aware of significant discrepancies within his alleged confessions. Despite conclusive DNA evidence indicating that he likely did not murder Mary Sullivan, the final victim attributed to the Strangler Del Salvo continues to be included in the roster of infamous American serial killers by criminologists. Interestingly, Del Salvo himself reportedly confided to select individuals that he was not the perpetrator. Readers of Susan Kelly's book are likely to lend credence to his claims. Between June 14, 1962 and January 4, 1964, 13 single women in the Boston area fell victim to a series of murders perpetrated by either a single serial killer or multiple assailants. Law enforcement believed that at least 11 of these incidents were the handiwork of a lone perpetrator, dubbed by the media as the Phantom Fiend or Boston Strangler. 
Initially targeting elderly women, with six deaths occurring within just over two months, the perpetrator later shifted focus to younger victims. A prominent psychiatrist suggested that the killer had overcome his fixation on his mother and had transitioned to women of his own age. All victims were subjected to sexual assault, and many were strangled using items of clothing, some of which were tied into bows. Albert Del Salvo, a construction worker already incarcerated for unrelated burglaries and sex offenses, confessed to attorney F. Lee Bailey, who negotiated a deal that resulted in Del Salvo being imprisoned without ever facing trial for the murders. However, it appears that certain members of the Boston area police force harbored doubts regarding whether the true culprit had been apprehended. These doubts were expressed to Susan Kelly, a writer, when she visited the police department in Cambridge, Massachusetts on November 8, 1981, conducting research for a novel centered around a serial killer. Believing in the official account of Del Salvo herself, she was astonished to discover that numerous individuals involved in the case harbored serious doubts regarding its political narrative. While city officials had benefited from reassuring the terror-stricken populace that the Boston Strangler had been apprehended, few well-informed individuals accepted this assertion. True, Del Salvo had confessed, and true, he had provided many accurate details, but there were underlying reasons unrelated to his guilt as a murderer. Encouraged to delve into the matter independently, Kelly encountered numerous law enforcement officers eager to divulge their insights. Consequently, she penned The Boston Stranglers, released in 1995, not only to challenge Del Salvo's credibility, but also to propose the existence of multiple viable suspects for the murders, casting doubt on the notion that all the incidents were attributable to a sole perpetrator. Kelly presents a compelling case, drawing from documented evidence and interviews, advocating for the exclusion of Del Salvo from the roster of notorious serial killers, urging instead to remember him solely as the pitiable green man and measuring man. Furthermore, she suggests expunging the string of crimes attributed to the Boston Strangler from encyclopedias and criminological analyses of serial murder. Given the centrality of Del Salvo's confession to the perception of him as the infamous killer, notwithstanding an alleged recantation, it is probable that these crimes were not as neatly interconnected as previously believed. Kelly references various sources of information accessible at the time suggesting that Del Salvo could have acquired crucial details about the crimes from them. Particularly noteworthy were the highly detailed newspaper accounts, with the Record American even publishing a comprehensive chart alongside photographs of the victims, labeled the Facts on Reporter's Strangle Worksheet. This chart provided a condensed summary of the significant particulars of each crime, including details about the victim's attire, hobbies, and associations. Kelly asserts that Del Salvo had committed this chart to memory, evidenced by his confession to John Bottomley, during which he not only accurately recalled the information contained within, but also replicated the few inaccuracies present on it. Leakages from law enforcement entities, notably the Strangler Bureau, which faced criticism for its lax handling of amassed materials, along with the Suffolk County Medical Examiner, who purportedly conducted several unsanctioned press briefings, freely disseminating details regarding victim autopsies, are highlighted. Additionally, Albert's prior activities as a burglar positioned him within many of the apartment buildings where the women were slain. Familiar with the apartment layouts, he had even visited each unit post-murder. The addresses had been publicized, information consciously and inadvertently supplied to him by individuals eager to expedite the investigation, such as John Bottomley, whom Kelly contends knowingly and intentionally furnished Albert with details about the murders during the latter's confession. This elucidates why the sole versions of the confession ever disclosed were truncated and extensively altered. The complete rendition essentially absolves Del Salvo, potentially incorporating details furnished by the individual who actually perpetrated some of the crimes. Law enforcement conjectured that George Nasser, an inmate incarcerated alongside Del Salvo, might have served as one such informant, or it could have been someone akin to Nasser, given Del Salvo's apparent readiness to confess in exchange for the reward to benefit his family and garner fame. With nothing to forfeit, 
Del Salvo could have been easily manipulated by another inmate, as has occurred in previous instances. Kelly contends that the fundamental issue with the concept of the Boston Strangler lies in the fact that the modus operandi, MO, varied significantly from one murder to another, contrary to what official police statements acknowledged. Kelly highlights several notable differences. For instance, there is no resemblance between the comparatively delicate manner of killing Patricia Bissett, whose murderer tucked her into bed, and the horrifyingly brutal violation inflicted on Mary Sullivan, whose assailant not only sought to degrade her by inserting a broom handle into her vagina, but also intended to taunt whoever discovered her body by placing a greeting card against her foot. One victim was stabbed but not sexually assaulted, while another was raped vaginally and then strangled. One body was left provocatively on a floor, while another was positioned over a bathtub. Although cigarette butts were found at some crime scenes but not others, this alone does not conclusively prove anything. However, when coupled with other concerns raised by Kelly, it does cast doubt on the validity of the official narrative. Del Salvo met a tragic end at Walpole Prison in 1973 when he was stabbed to death. Allegedly, the evening before his death, he had phoned a psychiatrist in New York, inviting him to the prison the following day, indicating he had something significant to divulge and suggesting that a reporter also be present. However, the planned meeting never materialized as Del Salvo succumbed to a brutal attack by fellow inmates that very night. The psychiatrist, who had harbored doubts about Del Salvo's guilt as a killer, publicly stated that Del Salvo had intended to unveil the truth behind the charade and identify the real perpetrator. But sadly, he never had the opportunity to do so. Kelly posits that during the period of the strangulations, there were likely at least six perpetrators at work in the vicinity, with the potential for there to have been even eight or nine. Some murders were opportunistic, while others were committed to silence witnesses to burglaries, a grim reality not uncommon in a bustling metropolis. Kelly observed indications that a more robust case was being constructed against another suspect until Del Salvo's confession, after which the investigation was abruptly terminated. In her view, by attributing all the crimes to Del Salvo, numerous individuals potentially evaded accountability for their acts of murder. A revised edition of Kelly's book was published in 2002, coinciding with her involvement in a team of forensic experts tasked with exhuming the remains of both Mary Sullivan and Albert Del Salvo. Kelly recounts the findings which reaffirm her long-standing belief. Del Salvo's account of what he purportedly did to Mary Sullivan did not align with the condition of her remains. Consequently, it appeared that he had mischaracterized the events, a discrepancy that had gone unchecked back in 1964. Moreover, the presence of DNA not matching Del Salvo's indicated the involvement of another individual in the murder. These revelations cast significant doubt on the veracity of his entire confession. Thank you for watching till the end of the video. I hope you will like the ending of this case. See you again in the next video.